My name is Conrad Weiner, and I will share my story with you. I'm generally introduced as a Holocaust survivor. I like to think of myself as a child that survived the Holocaust because of the selfless effort of my mother against slim odds for my survival without doctor's care and medication. I will elaborate on that later. <clears throat> on April the 30th, I reached the rightful age of 80. At age 80, I'm the youngest survivor in the tri-state area. If you do your math, you realize I must have been very young when I was marched into a concentration camp as opposed to extermination camps. I do not pretend to remember everything. However, when we were liberated, I was seven and a half years old. I remember some items from that time. We were very fortunate that we were together with only my mother, one of her sisters, her brother-in-law, and a nephew. So at that time, being together, we had what today would be called group support. We lived in Romania in peace with our neighbors, Bukovina. Actually, Jews lived in that part of the country since the 17th century. Things were separate but equal. Everything changed when the Austro-Hungarian Empire occupied Bukovina. They decided, for tax purposes, that Jews should have less names. They went by your profession. If you were a shoemaker, your name became Schuster. If you were a tailor, your name became Schneider. They also went by your height or shortness, gross or Klein. Well, my original name before I was adopted was Deutsch, Konrad Deutsch. Strange name for a Jewish boy. Some bureaucrat probably had fun doing it. Things went on pretty peacefully. When Romania became a country, then the Jews were not allowed citizenship, although it was required after the treaty from World War I. Later on, when the Germans became allied, became occupying Romania, things became very, very bad for the Jewish people. <clears throat> it started by having us wear the Star of David. That wasn't enough. We had to wear an armband with the Star of David. They had but today would be like an ID card that any time when the police could stop you, our ID cards were marked with the word Jew. Later on, they decided that there are too many Jews running our country, not realizing that that was the only opportunity for us, profession or banking. We could not own factories or land. So they decided to eliminate every professional from their respective union. Jewish doctors could only practice on Jewish patients. They started to boycott Jewish stores. And from then it got worse. A very anti-Semitic group came to power. Red the army and they were really just thugs. They started to authorize people to just go into a Jewish house, take whatever they wanted. Pretty soon, word came around that we should pack only what we can carry and stay outside of the building to be picked up by trucks to take them to a makeshift ghetto. We waited outside. My 
grandmother, being old, got tired. I had an aunt who was visiting from Palestine and got cut by the war. So she suggested that they go in the house and when the convoy starts moving, then they will join them, unbeknown to them. Soldiers were told to make sure nobody is hiding. They found my aunt, my grandmother, they brought them outside, they shot them in front of everybody just to intimidate other people from attempting to escape or to run away. <laughs> we were loaded into trucks and taken to a school that was cordoned up make, like a makeshift ghetto. We were very scared because days prior in Yassi, the city where Ali Wiesel was born, may he rest in peace, on our highest holiday, the Day of Atonement, they locked the synagogue doors and set the synagogue on fire. Regardless of secular you are, on that day you're in the synagogue. Over 400 people perished in that single attack. Eventually, we were taken to a train station. It really sounds bad, but it's fortunate that they went to the train station because other convoys were just taken to the Nister River, lined up, machine gun, and just thrown into the water. We were packed into cattle cars. I don't know if you've seen one. They have small windows, enough for animals to breathe, but not for 80 or 100 people. Our journey lasted for two days and one night. No water, no food, no facilities. When the doors finally opened, when the train stopped, people who were not used to hardship, the very old, the very young, perished in transit. Everybody else was jumping out, begging for water. Romanian soldiers with big smiles on their faces were emptying buckets of water on the ground, laughing when people were scooping up a little bit of water just to get their lips wet. From there, we started our travel by foot into the Ukraine, the artificial region called Transnistria, meaning the other side of the Dniester River. <coughs> Our journey lasted for over two weeks. It was late fall, early winter. The Nazis realized that people will perish in the transit, in the march. So they had peasants dig mass holes every 10 kilometers apart. When we got into the Ukraine, People were lining up, looking at the convoy to see if somebody had a suitcase that looks might have some valuable things or a coat with a fur color. They would buy that person from the guards and kill him for their possessions. In the distance, as you looked, you can see what may be covered branches with snow and mud. Getting close, you realize that those were bodies left on the side of the road. We were very fortunate that my uncle, big strong guy, was with us. He carried me. I was only three and a half years old. When, I, when my cousin got tired, who was four years older, he let me walk a little bit and carry my cousin. If you keep, do not keep up with the pace of the convoy, you were shot and left behind. People asked, well, how come you didn't escape? There was a bounty on our head. Ukrainians or Romanians turning you in were getting a lot of money. But contrary to the general belief, a lot of the young people, when they were sleeping in forests, were escaping and joining the partisan, the Soviet underground movement. We were very fortunate my uncle had military training. 
So he arranged for us to sleep in shifts because people were leaning against the wall that was warm or against a tree and freeze during the night. When we finally arrived to a small little town, Budi, in the Ukraine, our accommodation were less than desirable. They were stalls and barns where the animals were consumed. And the Soviets did the same things to the Ukrainian as they did to the Bukovina people. When they occupied, they took all male of military age into their army without trading, put him on the front line. This is how I lost my father, I don't remember him. We had barracks where we were sleeping on the floor on straw. They were so crowded that when somebody turned, it was like a domino effect. Everybody was trying to turn to get a space. But like you say here, ingenuity is mother of invention, necessity. They found a barrel, who knows what was in it before. <coughs> Downspout from a bombed out house. They made a stove. They used some of the unoccupied barns, took the doors off, made our doors a little bit more easier to eat with the stove. The stove also was for warming up whatever food we could barter for at the beginning. The people that were able to work were taken to the, to out of the camp to the forest. Our camp was charged with cutting timber, timber for fortification for the Nazis. They were getting a little bit of brown water, coffee in the morning, piece of bread, at lunchtime, they were getting some soup, lucky to find a rotten tomato in it, or a potato, whatever. And in the evening again, they would get a little bit of bread and coffee. The rest of us were left on our own. Originally, we were bartering for food. But eventually, because all the uh, Ukrainian men being gone, the women let us work their fields in exchange for food. I was extremely sick, couldn't hold on any food. People in our barracks told my mother, let them die in peace. Fortunately, at the risk of her own life, she climbed a cherry tree to pick the twigs and branches, made tea that eventually helped me hold food and brought me back to a little bit more health. The winter of 42 was extremely harsh. C coldest in history. In the morning, people were coming, the undertakers, with a sled to each barn, asking if anybody had perished. They took one of the barns and made a morgue shift uh, morgue. In our religion, you're supposed to be with a deceased person until such time that they are buried. The ground was frozen, they couldn't bury anybody. Somebody was in that morgue 24 seven. A lot of people that were not used to hardships perished leaving a lot of orphans. They took another barn and converted it to an orphanage. Like in any religion, you're supposed to take care of the poor, the widows, and the orphans. Even under those horrible conditions, that was a priority. It's hard to believe we had a wedding. The groom didn't have a shirt, probably bartered it for food or whatever, but he had a tie. He was elegant. My stepfather's brother-in-law was a cantor. He formed the children's choir, did anything possible to keep our minds off of what was going on. On one of the inspections of the camp, 
a Nazi soldier gave me a piece of chocolate. It's like giving you a piece of gold. I had to wait till my mother came home so she could divide it exactly in half for my cousin and myself. Well, she had to throw it away. There were rumors that they were poisoning food, booby-trapping toys, just doing everything possible to destroy us. We lived there for over four years. I told at the beginning that we were supposed to pack only what we could carry. Education is so important that people brought books. The women that could not work the field, the old, the sick, were our teachers. I remember writing with a pencil. It was so small, like writing with my fingers. But we had to do our homework. We had to learn. I remember always being cold and hungry. People generally ask me, did you have any toys? Well, my cousin and I found a small door from a bombed out house and we used that as a sled to go into the craters created by the bombs that they were going around. I remember one group of Nazis came to inspect the camp and they were cleaning their tank when some of the ammunition exploded. And it was a terrible sight. I can still probably remember it. That went on for over four years till finally one day, young partisans, 18, 19 year old kids, you're free, you're free to go, you're free to go. We were scared. A few days later, the Soviet army came to the camp. And then we knew that the war is about ended. And we started to walk our way back while the international community was deciding what to do with the refugees. Germany didn't want us, Russia didn't want us, Romania didn't want us. So we worked our way from small town to small town till the international community convinced the countries for repatriation. In other words, we were allowed to return of, of the country of origin. So after a long time, we returned to Romania. We lived in my grandfather's house that was partly damaged by the bombs. But then, Romania became a communist party, communist country. It's like going from the frying pan into the fire. Anti-Semitism was still alive and well, but it was a little bit undercover. Again, food was rationed. It was very scarce. You were getting an allowance of bread by the type of physical job that you had. Meat was rationed. You had to stay in line. Most of the time you got in line, it was ran out. My mother had four sisters that lived in America before the war. They arranged for us to have entrance visa to the United States. Every year around Christmas, my assignment was to write to the Romanian government asking for an exit visa, which was every time denied. Finally, in 1960, under pressure from the international community, Romania had to show that nobody wants to leave the country. So they put out a decree that if you want to leave the country, you have to come to the police station and register. The day that they picked for registration was again our highest holiday. The rabbi said that if everybody shows up, they can arrest everybody. We'll pray later. So there were lines two blocks around the police station. International community snapping photos. They had no choice but to start leaving people out. They left out the old, the sick. And finally, 
1960, where I could not go to college because I had relatives in America, in Israel, I got a job in a clock factory. And I worked my way up to a supervisory position. And one day, the director of the factory, the nicest person you ever want to meet, called me to his office. I get in there. To his right was the chief of the Communist Party for the factory. On his left, Secret Service, somebody you recognize from a mile away. And this nice, sweet gentleman starts to call me every name in the book. You're a traitor, you're a disgrace. How could I have trusted you? You lied to me. I cannot believe I trusted you so much. Starting tomorrow, you sweep the floor in the factory. Get out. 15, 20 minutes later, he calls me back, closes the door behind us, throws his arms around me, and says, you lucky dog, you're leaving for the United States. This is how we found out. The Secret Service wanted to give me a last punch. The paperwork was just absolutely incredible. So much, so much red tape, but we went through it. It was a small town and word spread like fire. Did you hear about the family leaving for the United States? Did you hear about the people leaving for the United States? Well, we thought the United States, the streets are paved with gold. There was a rumor that if you buy a gas from the same station for a certain period of time, you get a free car. Not a bad idea. But the reality was that when we finally came the day that we were embarking to go, people that we never knew were at the train station to say goodbye to us. We were afraid to talk to anybody till we got into Austria, the first free country. Our relatives in the United States arranged for us to be able to spend a few days in Vienna just to get used to freedom in a few, year, few days in Paris. So I was very interested in photography. I could not bring out a camera from Romania. They went into a camera shop asking if I can buy a camera, and I showed them how much money I had. He laughed. He said, that's about enough to buy a film. So I said, well, I'd really like to take some pictures. He said, where are you from? Romania. Oh, are you Jewish? Yes. You're going to United States? Yes. Wait a minute. Austrians are also supposed to be very anti-Semitic. But this gentleman went to the back of the store, came back with a camera. He said, somebody left us here for three years. I don't think they'll come back for it. He gave it to me. And that was the camera that when we arrived to the ship, I was taking pictures of my parents and everything. Now, food was rationed. Imagine on the ship, the luxurious buffets. We couldn't believe that anybody can have that much food available. We couldn't eat. We were sick, sick. We were seasick the first few days. We made up for it later. Finally, when we came, pulled into the harbor in New York, I cannot describe the feeling when you see the Statue of Liberty. It was just absolutely unimaginable. My cousin waited for us, took us to my aunt's house in Brooklyn, and the first thing that she did, 1960, she gave me $2 to go downstairs and get a haircut, including the tip. Because I was a hippie before it was even popular in the United States. So from there, I went to Pittsburgh, and Uncle Sam was extremely generous to me. He gave me an entire year to learn the language. Then he drafted me into the army. In the army, they give you what they call intelligence tests. They were puzzled. I spoke five languages. I was very good in math. But yet simple things like how many players in a baseball team, I had no idea. I was growing up playing soccer. 
how many points on a touchdown? I had no idea. So the company commander made it a point to meet me. Then he realized it's a language barrier. He said, fantastic, we are going to send you to California to our language school. Imagine that trip from frozen Kentucky into sunny California, beautiful. Only to get there and find out that I cannot be admitted to the language school because I am not a citizen. Okay for me not being a citizen to protect the country, carry a weapon, but not to go into the language school. In their wisdom, the army assigned me to Germany. It sounds horrible, but it was a wonderful experience. I speak their language, I learned their literature. I knew that not everybody could be brainwashed. And I was right. I formed some lifelong lasting friendships. One of my friends, his mother lived across the streets from our barracks. Anytime I didn't like something, I used to call her up, Oma, Grandma, I don't like what we have for dinner. Or oh, come over, come over, I have something for you. Another friend who even looked alike was a salesman for a flower company. And his customers were throwing these tremendous Christmas parties. He arranged for me to have time off to attend the parties with him, introducing me as his brother. We went together skiing in Austria. We went together on vacation. And all this time they knew that I'm Jewish. When I got out of the army, I took advantage of the GI Bill, and I went to college. I went to Indiana University. That was the only school that would give you unlimited advanced credits. You take a test, you get B or above, you get credit. That helped me finish a four-year program in two years because I was already married and had a child. From there, UC gave me a scholarship to their business administration school. So I got a degree in business administration. I worked for my own company, I worked for another company, till I retired and I became a substitute teacher. I was born. First two weeks was great. Couldn't play golf every day. My bodies were still working, so I became a substitute teacher. One of the classes, in one of the best high schools in the country, we were teaching World War II history. One of the students reminded, remembered that I'm from Europe. Mr. W, you're from Europe, right? Yes. Did you meet Hitler? After I collected myself, I explained to him that Europe is a rather large continent, and besides, Hitler and my family traveled in different circles. So he said, what did you do during the war? He said, I spent four years in a concentration camp. Without batting an eye, the kid said, what were you concentrating on? The rest of the class busted out laughing. But he had no idea. It so happens that a few days later, the Holocaust and Humanity Center asked me if I would like to share my story. I realized that this school creates our leaders. If they have people that are that ignorant, and I have two granddaughters that have to grow up in that environment, I should stare, share my story. That was 13 years ago. Today, at 80, obviously I survived. However, I'm a witness to atrocities committed by men against men. It is sad that we have not learned from history. Killings are still going on today. It's no longer called a Holocaust from burned by fire. It's called genocide. It's called any other names, but people are just as dead. 
So please, do whatever you can to stand up against injustice and discrimination. Thank you for your time.